Welcome to another episode of One on One Sports, where today we'll be covering three kinds of football. NFL. College football. And the Champions League. And it all starts right now. Welcome inside 101 Sports. We got a lot of football to cover, but first let's get things started off with the quick hitters. So Chase, Josh Gordon is going to make a return to the Kansas City Chiefs. Give us your thoughts. Another return for Flash Gordon. Times were good when he was dominating the league with guys like Jason Campbell, Hoyer the Destroyer, and who could forget Brandon Whedon at quarterback. Oh my God. That being said, that was eight years ago. Uh, do we expect Josh Gordon to come in and be the number three receiver on this Chiefs team behind Kelsey and Hill? No. No. The, pro the answer is probably no. Uh, so they are going to have to find that extra weapon for the Chiefs. Uh, and this year, the Chiefs are beatable. We've seen that this year so far. Right now, last in the AFC West. I don't doubt this team can uh, get back on track, uh, but we're going to have to see. I mean, this team, you know, has plenty of potential to come back, obviously. But again, mm -hmm. like you mentioned, the last time that Josh Gordon had a very productive season, I was 13 years old. We were in middle school. I don't know how people are thinking that Josh Gordon's just going to come into this team and be some kind of a threat. It's like Le'Veon Bell coming in. He came in. Mm -hmm. He ended up being a reserve running back. Last time he played was 2019. He played with the Patriots, got traded to the Seahawks, where he only played five games for them. It wasn't very productive. So I don't know how Josh Gordon can be really any kind of benefit to this Kansas City Chiefs team. And again, they're the Chiefs. They'll mm -hmm. bounce back. They uh -huh. have an all-star roster. They'll of be Of course. Fine. But so, speaking of football, though, Tom Brady returning to Foxborough, his much-anticipated return. So uh, mm -hmm. how, many, how many points are the Bucs going to win by? Uh, probably a few. A few. Um, yeah, I don't see... Uh, the upset happened where Belichick uh, gets back at Brady. Brady went and won Super Bowl with Tampa. Uh, I think Brady's going to come out on top here. And he is going to take that passing yard record home. Uh, he's only 68 yards away. It's almost guaranteed that he picks that up. Uh, but I don't see if the Patriots were to somehow pull out a win. Of course, you're going to see the headlines. Belichick made Brady. But I think it's pretty guaranteed that Brady's going to come away from the win. It's also guaranteed that he'll be adding to this record 10 years down the road. I mean, he's, I mean, he's got to be in the league until he's, what, probably like 54, you know, when we're out of school with James oh, yeah. and that kind of thing. He's going to stick around. I mean, he's got to. Yeah. But also, I mean, how sick is that going to make Patriots fans? I mean, your franchise quarterback, the, probably the greatest leader, greatest player in NFL mm -hmm. history, leaves your team, goes and, win the, goes and wins the Super Bowl, Year one, and it's going to come back and break the all-time passing yards record in your own backyard. It's got to sting, especially when you're sitting there with bootleg Tom Brady and Mackie Jones. Oh, uh, it's not the best situation poor for man. Pats fans, uh, mm -hmm. but you got to be a little happy for your guy. I so. mean, they had they had a 20-year run. It's it's about time they started losing. Yeah. And so also speaking of not losing, the United States of America in the Ryder Cup. Can, can we get can we get a USA chant going? USA, 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 winning 19 to 9, one of the biggest margins of victory in the history mm -hmm. of the Ryder Cup. I mean, the USA just got it done. It was the largest margin of victory in a Ryder Cup since 1967. This is the youngest team in USA history. The press conference afterwards was hilarious, <laughs> may I add. Uh, but it's a great win for the boys back home. Always nice to see the USA on top. I mean, on top, the USA was 2-7 and seven in the last nine Ryder Cups, and then come out and they just do this. Like mm -hmm. you said, the youngest roster, and I mean, poor Dustin Johnson. I mean, being the old head in the press <laughs> conference. Everybody else is wasted, and he's just up there trying to get He's trying just to get like, done. I'm the old head. We're going to get this done. But uh, speaking of getting it done, Michael Porter Jr. getting five years, $207 million. I mean, first of all, that's a waste of money. I'm sorry. We, we have Jack Nuttall who's here, who's a Nuggets fan, and Jack, I'm sorry, but that's just a waste of money. You're the, third, you're the fourth team now with three max players, and you're the bottom four of those teams because you couldn't beat the Suns in the Western Conference semifinals. Sorry if that puts some salt in the wound, but what do you think of this deal? Uh, many people will see it as an overpay. I see it as the Nuggets had to do it. If they didn't pay them, some other team somewhere was going to pay them all this money. Uh, and in the NBA now, you have to buy potential, and that's really what Michael Porter Jr. is. 
Uh, last, uh, in his career, he's shooting 53% from the field, 44% from three. And the defense still needs work. Uh, last season, he averaged more turnovers than assists. So there still is work to be done. But you have to buy into the potential, and you have to hope that this core of Jokic, Jamal Murray, Aaron Gordon, and Porter can put it together and get this team out of the West. I don't think they're getting out of the West because, I mean, again, you've got the Phoenix Suns still there. But, again, what is it, Lakers, Nets, and who's the, who's the other one? It's Lakers, Nets, and who's the other max contract team that's got three of them? Mm -hmm. And it's got to be, I think, yeah, it's the Golden State Warriors because they're also paying, you know, Andrew Wiggins a max contract. Mm -hmm. What can I do to, you know, get $45 million a year now? Because, I mean, I can, you know, break my back in a bunch of places and I can get $45 million. That'd be fantastic for me. Well, you know this is fantastic. We're starting off with Teddy Morgan and Sam Landsman starting off a strong here on this episode with some NFL. Welcome back to 101 Sports. And first, we're going to start off on the NFL gridiron. I'm here with Teddy Morgan and Sam Landsman. And guys, a lot of good week four matchups upcoming. We're going to start off with the Cardinals and Rams. Sam, who you got in this one? All right, so I'm just going to start off. I love with the Rams. They have a minus four and a half point spread. Cooper Cup, let's just say he's been nothing short of immaculate. He's the number one overall wide receiver in ESPN PPR leagues. He's averaging eight, eight and a half uh, receptions per game, 122 yards, and already has five touchdowns. He was also just awarded the NFC Offensive Player of the Month. And then Stafford, he's been great too. He's a nine to one touchdown to interception ratio. He's averaging over 300 yards a game. And they also just torched the Bucks and Tom Brady. Like, I don't think there's any hotter team in football. There's no real case that you can make against that. And he's, they're honestly the best team in football right now. And then of course you have Aaron Donald and Jalen Ramsey, the hardest top five offense. I really think that they're going to be doing very well in this game. There's not a lot of leeway for Arizona. Like, yes, you do have Kyler Murray, who's been doing great. But honestly, you have DeAndre Hopkins, who hasn't been doing amazing so far this season, only looking at four and a half targets per game, 52 yards. Like, mm, I don't know. What do you think? I think Kyler Murray, he's been doing great so far. Both teams are 3-0. This is going to be yeah. a great game. Um, ton of points. Uh, slam the over. But... Um, Cardinals plus four and a half. I just think they're either going to make it close or they're going to win. And Kyler Murray playing like a video game character out there. He's been great. They have so many weapons. Him to Rondale Moore is just like similar to Tyreek Hill and Patty Mahomes. Um, they've got A.J. Green. He's back to somewhat of what he's been okay. and back to a familiar form. They've got a lot of old guys. They've got J.J. Watt coming in and he's been good. Chandler Jones. I just think he's... Um, not, not any sacks since his five sack week one match, but um, I just think he's going to bring it this week. Uh, Buda Baker as well. Um, the Rams, on the other hand, they have the sixth least uh, rushing yards in this, this year, and without Daryl Henderson, you can't really rely on Sony Michel to do anything. Um, I just don't trust this Rams rush. It's a fair point, but I do have the last three matchups for Arizona have begun against Tennessee, Jacksonville, and the Vikings, who all have bottom five, uh, 25 defenses in 2020 and have not done great to start this season. I just really think Arizona is not ready to face this top notch of a defensive unit and is very powerful offense as the Rams. Like I think honestly, Arizona will be playing catch up for most of this game, and I don't and I don't think the Ra they're really gonna be able to have a shot, a shot against the Rams. I think it's gonna be it could come down to a game winning drive, but I think the Rams have got it in the bag. To be honest with you, bro. Cardinals also have um, just to one last thing. Cardinals yeah. also have the second most takeaways in the league. I think scoring battle. I think defensive points and offensive points. The Cardinals have um, second in the league in total touchdowns on offense. It's going to be points, 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 and whoever scores the most points is going to win. That's going to be the Cardinals. I mean, that's basically the story of the NFC West right yeah, now. I mean, you, got the, you got the Rams, yeah. you got the Cardinals. Again, got to say, Rams best team in football right oh, now. Oh, yeah. They just, they just took care of the Buccaneers. But also, now, Teddy, it's going to hit a little close home for you. So, I mean, you're a Browns fan, right? Yeah. You're, you're taking the Browns in this one? So, yeah. Um, pretty obvious. Browns, uh, Kevin Stefanski returning to Minnesota, uh, where he spent a few years there. Um, there's a lot of familiarity in that room. Uh, he knows what Kirk Cousins brings, and I think Browns um, plus two and a half, or minus two and a half, sorry, is the bet to go there. Um, their rushing attack has been nothing short of spectacular. Um, Kareem Hunt had over 150 yards, um, and he's just been great so far. And Ch Chubb and Hunt have just been great, and I just love that rushing offense. 
Yeah, you got a point. I do like the Vikings covering the plus two and a half spread. I think you got Thielen, who's already has four touchdowns and averaging seven catches a game. You got Jay Jeff, Art, like he's doing been great. Howard, he has two touchdowns, 90 yards per game. And then also surprisingly, Kirk Cousins has, has been pretty solid. He's averaged, he has 300, 360 yards per game, eight touchdowns and no interceptions so far, which is pretty good for him. And then of course you have Dalvin Cook, the beast. He's, he was out week two against Arizona, but um, sorry, in week two against Arizona, he had 22 carries for 131 yards, averaging six yards a carry. That's hard to do. And uh, he wasn't even in uh, last week in Seattle. Um, the Vikings currently have the number three ranked offense in the NFL, averaging 29 points per game. That's, that's a lot. That's, they're doing quite well. And while I can admit that the defense is not the greatest, um, the Browns have been going up one, against one of the worst offenses in the league, as, as uh, the Chicago Bears and the Texans in Week 2, which obviously have one of the work, weaker offenses. And honestly, I think it's going to be a little bit of a challenge for the Browns to adapt, this, to, adapt to this dynamic of an offense as the, of the Vikings. What do you think? I think the key X factor for the Browns here is going to be Miles Garrett. Can he repeat what he did in uh, Week yeah. 3 against the Bears? He had five, four and a half sacks, putting him as the league leader in sacks so far this season. The team came in with three sacks going into the game. Now they have nine sacks. Um, I just... It's going to be interesting to see. They've loaded up on uh, overload with three linemen on one side and one on the other. And I think if they bring that attack with Tack McKinley, Jadavian Clowney, um, I think Malik Jackson as well, um, they can just really bring it to the Vikings and Elon Grad, Ole Udo. Um, I think they can give it to him. And I don't know if he can handle <laughs> Miles Garrett. Yeah, no, definitely. I, was, I can admit that the Browns, um, the pass rush is very good for them. But uh, honestly, I think that the Vikings, they have a lot of options. Another uh, guy who actually uh, showed bright lights uh, last week was Tyler Conklin, the tight end. He had seven receptions on eight targets and a score. I really think that all of these players like Dalvin Cook, Justin Jefferson, Thielen, and then now him, I think there, there's going to be a lot to cover on that offense. And I, I don't know if the Browns will be able to handle all that. And I feel like this game is going to be a shootout. It's going to, it honestly, it could come down to a game-winning drive. The Vikings are running hot right now. And honestly, I feel comfortable with the plus, the plus two, two and a half point spread for the Vikings. I just think it's going to be close. And yeah. Okay, so we've got time for one more game. And I'm going to go to you, Teddy, right here. You think the Texans have a shot at plus 16 and a half against the Bills. How does that happen? All right, call me crazy. I've been called that before. But um, this is historic. This is the highest spread since I believe it was the Rams Jets. And that was week 15 of 2020. And you might remember. The Rams lost to the Jets, and it was the Jets' first one of the season, broke their losing streak, um, and it's just, it's too good to pass up. I got Texans plus 16 and a half. They're not a great team. I don't think they're going to, like, they might win. I don't think they're going to win, but backdoor cover, you can't, yeah. you just can't take away that opportunity. So you're saying they're, so you're saying that they're too bad to have a spread that high, so that means they'll you know, they'll have a shot in the game. I think there'll be a backdoor cover, and I think they can, um, they got the extra rest from Thursday Night Football. I just, I like, I like their chances to put it closer than 17 points. And you think the Bills don't have a shot exactly? I, I, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it from me. The, the extra rest is going to make the big difference here. Honestly, <laughs> I think, bro, the Bills shut out the Dolphins in Week 2 by a score of 35 to nothing and absolutely torched Washington last week by 22 points. Don't like, talk about it. Don't talk I, about it. Don't talk about dude, it. Dude. I don't know what you think, how the Texans could have any chance in this game. Like, I don't even have to say what Josh Allen's done so far this year. Like, and also Zach Moss is finally able to get the, the uh, running uh, game open a little bit as well, too. And uh, also the Bills' defense, is like, they've been really good. They've only been allowing 14.7 points per game. Honestly, I really don't think that the Texans have a shot in this game. But then, do you really think that Davis Mills is going to keep it close with the Buffalo Bills? Mills Mafia, baby. Uh, the Texans are 2-1 and one against the spread, and I just... I think I like their chances to cover. Um, they're just, I don't know. I just like them, and I just, it's too good to pass up on. I really appreciate the optimism, but I think you're dead wrong. But <laughs> I mean, could be. It should be a very interesting matchup, one that I'm definitely going to be looking yeah. forward to and watching too. the Bills beat them by more than 16 and a half points. <laughs> so that'll wrap it up here on the NFL side. Thanks to Teddy and Sam. We'll be right back with more college football. We've talked NFL, now let's talk some college football. I'm here with Bryson Barnes and Colby Cook. And guys, a packed slate of games this weekend. I mean, what more can you ask than to sit on the couch, you know, with a nice beverage and knock one out watching some college football. So first, I've got to argue the biggest game so far. Georgia, Arkansas, 
Sanford Stadium, Athens, Georgia. Bryson, who you got? I got Georgia. Um, the Bulldogs are just too good. They have three really good running backs. JT Daniels has done a great job of leading that offense, and they've only given up 23 points through four games. We're looking at probably the best defense in the entire SEC, if not college football. And Arkansas does have some good wins. They beat Texas and they beat Texas A&M. So they are a good football team. But I just think Georgia is going to be too much for them to handle, especially as the game goes on. I think you're, you'll start to see Arkansas's offense start to sp uh, sputter a bit. And we don't even know how um, – we don't know the whole – health um, report for uh, K.J. Jefferson, the uh, quarterback for Arkansas. We have heard that he is probably going to play for them on Saturday, but it just sounds like he is overall not 100%, and you have to be 100% if you want to go into Sanford Stadium and beat Georgia. You know what, Bryson? I'm glad your name is not Connor Witzo because for <laughs> once I will agree with an analyst on this show. Georgia's taking this baby home. Yes, Arkansas has wins over Texas and Texas A&M. Sam Pittman has done an amazing job for Suey Pig Suey. But Georgia has one of the best defenses in the league. They've only allowed one touchdown for their defense. They're incredible. They're incredible. JT Daniels looks great. This is one of the best squads Kirby Smart's had in a long time, and they don't have that pesky Clemson squad to deal with. We'll get to that in a little bit. You're right. Kirby Smart is taking down Sam Pittman, although you got to say this is a very big season for Arkansas. They've exceeded expectations. Oh, absolutely. And so looking at another SEC matchup, another top 15 game, Alabama and Ole Miss, Lane Kiffin, Nick Saban. Colby, shock the world, please. <clears throat> well... I gotta say it, Luke. You may he may be Saban may be Kiffin's father, but in Return of the Jedi, the son wins, and that's exactly what's gonna happen in Tuscaloosa. Because listen, Matt Corral is an absolute stud. Okay, yes, Alabama and Ole Miss are per, pretty even in terms of teams, right? Matt Corral with a 186.9 rating, 68 completion percentage. Nine touchdowns on the year, over 20 passing touchdowns in the last three starts. They're looking good. Alabama was really tested against Florida. We saw that. Yes, opposing coaches are 0 23 against former opposing coaches are 0 23 for former assistants under Nick Saban, but it's about to be 1 and 23 this Saturday. Well, I say roll, tide, roll. And there's a simple reason because of that. Who has Ole Miss played? They've played no one so far this season. No one at all. They, haven't, they only played Austin P, Tulane, and Louisville. Louisville is the only somewhat decent team on that entire list. They just simply haven't played anyone. Matt Corral, yes, he's looked good this year, but as I said earlier, he hasn't really had much hard competition. And as we saw last year, he threw 14 picks through 10 games. That is not the numbers that you need to beat Alabama, that's for sure. And speaking of, Alabama has scored at least 45 points every single time that they've played Ole Miss since 2016. Ole Miss's defense cannot handle Alabama because so far this season they've averaged 21 points allowed against three pretty lousy teams so far. You know, Bryce Young is a great quarterback. He has three great running backs. He has great receivers in Jamison Williams and a lot of other core guys. So I just think Alabama's offense is going to be too much for Ole Miss to handle. Yes, Ole Miss will probably get some offense going, but it's definitely not going to be enough. I would agree with you on that. However, I would like to point out that last year, Ole Miss was really the only test in the SEC West for Bama. 48 points allowed by the Bama defense. Matt Corral, like we said, is a machine. Lane Kiffin is a machine. He's going to get serious looks for the USC job. He's not going to take it. He's not going to take it. <laughs> he he's going to get serious. Time. He's going to get serious looks. Well, you know what they say. George Bush said it very eloquently. In fact, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, you can't fool me again. But, <laughs> but, Lane Kiffin will get the job done this Saturday. Book it. He's going to betray them. That's what he did to Tennessee. He's going to do the same thing to Ole Miss. And he did the same thing to FAU. Yep. We can't forget the Owls. Yep. All right, so now we have an AAC matchup and an FBS independent matchup, Cincinnati and Notre Dame. Bryson, you like the Fighting Irish with this one. I do. I, honestly, at the beginning of the season, I thought Notre Dame was overhyped. You know, they had gone into overtime against uh, Florida State. They really didn't do that well against Purdue. But I think, honestly, they found their identity against Wisconsin. They smoked that Wisconsin team 
by nearly 30 points. And that Wisconsin team wasn't a pushover by any means. During that third quarter, specifically when they had that kickoff return, that's when they found their identity. Cincinnati, on the other hand, they're a very good group of five team, but they haven't really played anyone that impressive this year. Their biggest win so far is a subpar Indiana team. So I just think that Cincinnati doesn't have really the chops to go four quarters with Notre Dame. Conversely, you know, I think Cincinnati can take this. Desmond Ritter is amazing, and he definitely should be on that Heisman watch list. However, I agree with you. My concern is that weak schedule. But Desmond Ritter, 67.9 QB rating. Jack Cohn, 56.4 QB rating. And I think, personally, if Cincy wins this game, they could run the table, and they are well on their way to a New Year's Six Bowl. So this is their biggest test of the season. This will obviously be the hardest game they play all year. They've got showdowns with Tulane and Navy coming, but obviously if they can win this game against a team who, yes, you know, manhandled Wisconsin and beat Florida State. I mean, Florida State now does not have the resume that we thought they were going to have at the beginning of the year. So it's kind of a little shaky. It, it kind of gets into a mushy ground for me, and I think if Cincy can win this game, they are well on their way to a New Year's Six Bowl. Okay, so we're running out of time, guys. We're going to do some thoughts on our AP Top 25, but we're not doing that, all right? We have one more game preview, another shocker of a game preview, guys. We've talked about all these top 10 matchups, whatever, but people are forgetting the real game of the week that people should be watching. If you say Wake Forest, I swear. I'm not saying Wake Forest. Vanderbilt and UConn, the Toilet Bowl is here. $2 tickets at Commodore Stadium. Two of the most inept college football teams we've seen in a long time. So guys, Vanderbilt or UConn? Bryson, who you got? I'm gonna have to go with Vanderbilt. You know, uh, my mom's side of the family is for Nashville, from Nashville, so I have uh, at least somewhat of a connection to Vanderbilt. I went to a Vanderbilt game once and about half of the fans were visiting fans there. But at least, at the very least, Vanderbilt did beat Colorado State this year, another FBS school. A bad FBS school, but they still beat them. UConn, on the other hand, they couldn't beat Holy Cross, an FCS school. So therefore, I just think that Vanderbilt just has, I think they're just overall better than UConn. Well, I mean, when your coach retires mid-season, that, that is a telling sign. So the guys up in stores, Connecticut, it's, it's, it's tough scenes. It's not pretty. But, but listen, I think, here's, here's my personal opinion. I wish Sarah Fuller had not gone to North Texas <laughs> to get to get a graduate degree and play soccer because you put her in at QB against UConn and she is Rick rolling that defense, baby. <laughs> Rick rolling that defense. It's over. It's over. So anchor down, Vandy's getting the win. You are quite the character, Colby Cook. So that'll do it here for college football. So we've talked about NFL, we talked about college. Now we're going to hit the football pitch. We're going to talk about some Champions League coming up with Matt Laguza and Jack Nuttall. With Match Week 2 in the Champions League now in the books, who better to have on than Jack Nuttall and Matt Laguza to come on and talk about it? So, guys. The big question right now, FC Barcelona. I mean, what's going on with them? I mean, is Komen out at this point, Matt? Komen needs to be out. If they want anything, it, it, Ronald Komen had the famous quote, let's just say, yes, uh, thanks to me, this club has a future. And if Komen stays, the only future they have is selling all their promising young players because they are not going to want to stay at Barcelona. That's the only thing they have right now. Pedri, Ansu Fati, a ton of young talent, but they have, once they lost Messi, they, there's no structure there. Their entire front office is depleted. No one trusts them. Like, it, it's just a mess in Barcelona. And right now in the Champions League, they have now lost both match weeks 3-0. Barcelona, that is unheard of. You can't go two match weeks without scoring a goal. It's unheard of. And you just can't do that. They need something to change, and right now, it's Komen out. It has to be. See, the players came out and they backed Komen, which makes me believe that he's not the issue. I mean, you still get Aguero back from injury. You just got Ansu Fadi back from injury. Martin Braithwaite, hero of the Euros. Uh, Usman Dembele, the $100 million transfer from a couple years ago. They got a lot of talent on this team that they're not currently playing with. I'm an Arsenal fan. Like, we went three games and we didn't score a single goal. And now we're on a three-game win streak. Things change in soccer quickly. I really do feel like, yes, they have not been playing well recently, but their next three games, Atletico Madrid, 
Valencia, and Real Madrid. If they win two of those three games, they're solid. They're set for the rest of the year. Memphis Depay, still fire like always. Yes, I don't love this team, and I don't love what like the future, but I think they're going to be fine for now, definitely. What about Champions League, though? They've lost to Bayern Munich and Benfica, the two teams above them. Both of them, it, they have zero points. Barcel uh, uh, Bayern Munich, they've got six. Benfica, they have four. Do they have any chance of getting back into this contest with only four matches to go? At this point, no, but I think if they do get um, put into the Europe, uh, Europa League, they could definitely have a chance of winning that. Plus, with their standing in La Liga, I do think that, that even if they make top four, they'll be back in the Champions League next year regardless. So, yes, right now, through two match weeks, they look very poor. Arguably the worst team out of all the qualified teams, I would say. But their season's not over. They still have the European League, Europa League, just, or they can even come back in the Champions League. Yep. They have, still have La Liga. They still have all this like, Copa del Rey, all the Spanish Cups. They got plenty of time to sort things through. Right now, it's not looking good, though. And even so, I mean, they're sixth in the La Liga table, but I mean, three wins and three draws. They technically haven't lost, but like you said, Matt, three nil twice, especially to Benfica, who you'd think they would pick up some kind of result against. But now looking to the underdog teams again, we can talk about the, you know, the Man Cities, the PSGs. I'm looking for underdogs right now, Matt, but also, Jack, I want to go to you first, because yours is not the one that I was expecting. No, I'm looking at a team that... Well, they might not have been considered underdogs to begin with because of their group, but they've showed to be the best team out of the group so far, and that's Salzburg out of Austria. Right now, they're on four points through two games, but really it should be six points through two games. On last week, they went one for three on penalties, and they, and they drew 1-1. One, one. On Wednesday, two for two, and they won. I'm telling you, I think this team has the potential to go out of the group stage, qualify them in one spot, and potentially make an upset in the round of 16. I think this team is good. They got a lot of solid players. Kareem Adebay, Adeyemi, three goals. Ade he's got all three, all three goals for them, and he missed two penalties. So he could even have more than that. All I'm saying is watch out for them. Watch out for Kareem. And they got a really solid group that they could win all their games for them. I, watch, I like Salzburg a lot. I completely agree. That group is obviously probably the least talented group out of uh, all eight. And as you said, Kareem Adeyemi, he has already drawn four penalties this year. That is only second in history in the Champions League to the legend Aaron, Ro uh, Aaron Robin. He's only through two games right now. He is, has really quick feet. He's really fast. But you know what we have to talk about. Oh, absolutely. I think everybody we knows. need to talk about Sheriff. The Definitely. team with no legitimate country. The only countries that legitimize it are four countries that are not legit themselves. Yeah. And right now, they beat Real Madrid, and they are top of the group in the Champions League. You, you have I, to talk you about gotta it. You got to talk about it. You got it. It feels like it's made up, but it's not. <laughs> um, here's an even staggering stat for you. Real Madrid have, so Sheriff has a, a squad value of around $15 million. Uh, Real Madrid alone have 15 players worth more than that by themselves. And yet they went into Estadio Bernabeu and won 2 1. That might be the upset of the year. That might be the biggest upset since Leicester, Leicester won in this Premier League five years ago. I'm telling you, Sheriff beating Real Madrid never thought was possible. But you know what? Good for them. And they're looking really good right yeah. now because Inter has not played well at no, all. And they're really the only, yeah. none of them. And, you know, Inter is really the only other team that I could see getting it into that second position. Well, the Sheriff on top of the table, I, I, really, I, I think Sheriff actually beats uh, Shakhtar Donetsk the next time they play. And after that, I think they're pretty much set and through. Fair enough. I mean, just look at the road that they've had to go through. They went through three rounds of qualifying and then had to beat Dynamo Zagreb, who are now with West Ham United, come on, you Irons, in the Europa League. But, I mean, they've won their first two group stage matches, like you said, going into the Bernabeu. I mean, who goes into the Bernabeu right now and, you know, wins games consistently? And you have this I, I, team Sebastian who's, who's yeah. not even first in the Moldovan League right now. But, I mean, they're just picking up results. There, and that's what you have to do as an underdog in the Champions League. You just got to go out there, play your heart out, and do whatever you can. Like, that's exactly what young boys did against uh, Man United. And they came out with a win, thanks to the U.S. international Jordan Pifok, of course. Yes. But, you know, I think we've seen that a lot this year so far. A lot of underdog teams coming into big dog stadiums and getting wins. And this is why the Champions League is so amazing. You get underdogs like this competing every year. We had Monaco a couple years ago. We had Spurs a couple years ago. Do not go to the Super League. The Super League sucks. Keep the Champions League <laughs> does here suck. forever. Yes. It's kind of like March Madness. You, can, you, know, you got to keep in you oh, know, like exactly. the automatic qualifiers kind of exactly. thing. We like oh, it. Course. Okay, so one more quick thing. Messi and Ronaldo both scoring in match week two. Messi's first goal 
for PSG and Ronaldo with the game winner against Villarreal. Which one was more important, do you think? For me, I think overall, Messi, just with hold the history of him leaving Barcelona, coming to Paris, not scoring in his first three matches, and then an absolute banger into the top corner to seal the victory for Paris, Paris Saint-Germain. But for the Champions League, I think it's got to be Ronaldo. I think after such a heartbreaking loss to young boys in match week one, scoring the winner in 90 plus five, first of all, it should, they should not have gone that far without having the lead. But to get that win, especially with Ronaldo scoring it, that was huge. A lot of momentum going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I picked Messi just because I think they need his talents more yep. than Ronaldo or United needs Ronaldo's. I think Messi is almost more important to how PSG want to play moving forward. And just imagine this. If PSG don't win the Champions League, it's a colossal failure. Colossal. If United doesn't, it's it's a failure, but it's not as big of a, as a deal as PSG. Because if you've got like, likes of Neymar, Messi, Mbappe. Yeah, like come on. They got to win the Champions League. And that's why this Messi goal, very important. Huge. And so that'll wrap it up here from the football pitch with the Champions League. Special thanks to Jack and Matt for joining us. We'll be right back here on 101 Sports. Thanks for watching this edition of 101 Sports. To keep up with 101, make sure to follow us on all socials on Twitter and Instagram. And make sure to click that subscribe button, the like button, and make sure to click that notification bell. And as always, whose side are you, are you on? on?